Part one of introduction of a treaty of modern falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction. Hunting, fishing, and hawking are diversions which join profit to amusement. On the former account, they were anciently the serious business of all ranks, and on the latter are now followed by the great and opulent. Mankind were unacquainted in the more early period of society with the earliest arts of living, which accident or ingenuity has since brought to light. The spontaneous fruits of the earth afforded them but a lean and scanty subsistence. They were, therefore, obliged to prey on wild inhabitants of the forest, the flood, and the air. These animals were, many of them, superior to mankind in strength, all of them in agility, and some men could not master them by their bodily powers. In order, then, to get them into their hands, they sought the aid of contrivance and stratagem. They observed that the same creatures which they wanted to feed on were food to other creatures, qualified by nature to feed them. Thus, they saw the hare run down by the hound, the salmon dragged out of the pool by the otter, and the partridge borne away by the hawk. Human invention sharpened by necessity was wonderfully rich in resources. Men, seeing with what facility these creatures so these were fed, would soon perceive the advantage of being connected with them. Hence, they would form the design of taming them to their service. As the fields produce more animal food, than either the water or the air, the dog would be the first object of their flattering regards. Those who lived on the banks of the river would court the otter to their familiarity and make him contribute to their maintenance also. These essays would give origin to hunting and fishing, sorts which the skill and industry of succeeding ages have carried to their perfection. These sorts fall not within my design, and therefore I leave them with just observing that they were probably known before falconry. The reason is obvious. The fields and the streams were more acceptable than the heights of the air. And dogs and otters are at first much more tractable than hawks. Those methods of procuring food which appeared easiest would, for that reason, be preferred by a starving generation to those that seem next to impossible. It is from the amusement of children I am going to deduce the rise of the noble science of Falcon. They who know the esteem I have for this science will acquit me of having any design to lessen its dignity by such an origin. If people trace back the most useful arts of life, they will discover few of them which they do not owe their existence to chance. Whoever has examined the first appearance of a hawk must confess that it does not look as if it were capable of culture. Its eye is sharp and ferocious, its motions are quick and impatient, and it furiously attacks and ravishly feeds on its prey. Men would therefore regard the hawk as irreclaimable, and think as little of employing it to procure game for them as what the wolf of the rise them in venison. It seems impossible to write in deception, or shown to be practical by the devotions of children. Everybody knows how remarkably fond they are of young birds, and how tenderly they bring them up. They also display much ingenuity in wearing off the natural wildness of them, and in habituating them to understand their signals and obey their voices. Parents observing this innocent propensity of their children would gladly take every opportunity of gratifying it, and their way of life would give them many. The chase to which they were attached by necessity would sometimes lead them among the cliffs of high rocks, where hawks are wont to place their ears. When they lighted on those with eyes, the parental affection would prompt them to carry home the young birds to their children. Taught themselves by observation that hawks fed on flesh, they would direct their children to bring up the eyes of animal food. Young hawks now being continually among their hands and accustomed to the voices of children, would soon forget their natural wildness and contract an affection for those who bred them. They would fly from their hands, sail around them in the air, and return to them. On these occasions it would divert the children exceedingly to observe the consternation into which their birds cast all of the winged tribes and with what boldness they pursued in the packs of prey. Children are naturally generous and communicative, almost incapable of enjoying pleasure without a crowd 
Actuated by this disposition, they will invite their parents to partake of the happiness themselves drew from the price of the house. Imagine how great must have been the amazement of these simple people when they saw for the first time birds which ever before they had thought they were cloned with, mainly by the children. It would look like a prodigy to see them mounting to the skies from the hands which fed them, and returning immediately at the sound of the voices which caressed them. Men would still be more astonished to observe them so very tame, as even to part with their prey to their keepers, and fly afterwards in quest of more with their former spirit. Astonishment would give way to reflection. The more sagacious would perceive that by the hawk they might command the sky, and then to open a new source of provisions. The experiment was worth the making, and those who first conceived the idea of it with no doubt go directly about it. Expose them to ridicule and bring the fondness of their understandings in question. Among that set of mortals, who to the dome gifted run by nature, have made a proper addition of self conceit. The success of the first essay was soon put to song. Such a laughter as were not incorrigible and encouraged for perseverance. The hawk now showed their affection with the hound, and the training of it became the capital object of their attention. They studied to it, sought the best ways of preserving its health, and investigated remedies to cure its diseases. They imparted their observations to their children, who handed them to theirs, augmented by their own, and thus falconry grew out of experience of successive generations into the regular system into which we now see it. The science brought within the power of men every bird productive of food of diversion, and the air which had been so long to them a barren desert became a fund of luxury and recreation. Hawking is one of those amusements which is suitable to the majesty of kings and to the grandeur of nobility in higher gentry. It is easy to account for the air of dignity which now attends it. The experience of one age transmitted to another enlarged and polished the human mind, and then took hold of and improved every incident which tended to render life more easy and comfortable. As they proceeded in the culture of their intellectual powers, arts and trades were invented, and these in their turn promoted the advancement of civilization. Mankind accordingly withdrew some of themselves, gradually from their origin, that precarious way of living by hunting, and engaged in pursuits which at once softened their tempers and procured them a certain livelihood. Hawking and the other sports of the field were indeed productive of much diversion, but not always to defend them from the attacks of hunger, and therefore were glad to exchange them for occupations which never put them to fruitless toil. Falconry now ceasing to be regarded by the lower ranks of men as necessary for the support of life, fell entirely into the hands of persons of birth, fortune, and leisure. Kings and princes, nobles and gentlemen, pursued the sport of the sky, while their inferiors made carts, followed the plow of their cattle. Nothing could be more fortunate to society than this revolution, which was the cause of the gentility and greatness that are now ascribed to Hawking. It delivered this art of promoting strength and agility as a learning of pastime from Cleveland Meek and reflected on it the honor and magnificence of the illustrious personages who were devoted to it. Monarchs now took the hawk under their protection and Senate enacted laws for the preservation of its life. The same hands which swayed the scepters of nations and stretched forth commanding truncheons of victorious hosts did not disdain the weight of the keen eyed bird. Slave lawgivers viewed it with admiration and thought they were improperly important in securing it from the folly and violence of men. The muse of cheering scoff to what edifices were reared from its reception and officers with honorable salaries were appointed to take care of its welfare.
and train it up for its functions. Parkinsworth, the city where it still triumphs, demonstrates the honor one. It is still held by all the princesses of Europe. The main thing is how can it dare to provide the finest place. The main pleasures which flow from its spirit, rapidly and tractableness, made it worthy of and rewarded all the attention of which it was the object. When it pursues its way to the clouds, it drives up the eyes of all men after it and fills their souls with the most agreeable fits of surprise. So exquisite is the delight it then bestows that it robs sovereign of the obsequious regards of their soothing courtiers and confounds the lords of the earth with the amazing and wonderful crowd which surrounds them. When we compare the state of falconry in our own days with what it was in ancient times, we must acknowledge in the next its sad decay in the world. It is not difficult, and it may be worthwhile, to point out this deplorable revolution of sporting and its causes. It was when hounds and hawks were the only means whereby the recreations of the field could be enjoyed with dignity, that the reputation of falconry was high. It was then studied and practiced by men of rank and distinction in every country of Europe, where anything of civilization existed. Game was to be found everywhere in the greatest plenty, without the interposition of the legislator for its preservation. Hawks being adapted to give much sport without much slaughter. But firearms were at length invented, and this invention introduced as remarkable an alteration in the sporting as it did into the art of war. The sportsman had hitherto drawn his pleasure from observing the various surprising turns of the shape or flight, and when he obtained it, he was a little mortified that the hare of woodcock made its escape at last from his hounds or hawk. This is the true idea of the pleasure which the sports of the field are qualified to afford. But this idea was gradually lost after guns were made of easy carriage and pointers trained to find out game. Sport came now to be confined entirely to the act of putting the game to death. And a man measured the liveliness of his diversion according to the number of animals he had slain. But still, no birds were yet killed which kept in cover, and therefore the game continued to be plentiful enough for every kind of sport. This new idea, however, of sport made Hawkins the calm, because a good marksman could produce more of this bloody force of amusement from his gun than from a hawk. It also helped very much to bring the latter into disuse, as the former could be kept with less expense and without any trouble. Though the pointer and the gun were of considerable detriment to Hawkins at their first introduction, yet they did not triumph over this diversion till the dexterity of the French lighted on the knack of shooting on wing and taught it to their neighbors. This knack enabled every man to act up to his idea of sporting by the ease and certainty with which it enabled him to kill game. And thus it reached the blow to falconry which has proved almost fatal to it. A man of sure eye may now kill or wound in a few days all the fowls of an extensive moor and by this means the gun has not only hurt falconry, but also gone near to exterminate the game altogether. Hawking is at present confined to a few noblemen and gentlemen, who with their spirit of the, their great ancestors inherit their masculine taste to the source of the field likewise. The almost universal attachment of sportsmen to the pointer and gun shows their degeneracy and the elevated amusements of the predecessor. In a life, a life which I never opened my eyes to, without all the anguish of the bitterest regret. Could a falconer who lived two or three centuries ago, ah, uh, that flourishing period of the princely sport, burst forth the chains of death and get for a few days into the world, how it would grieve his manly heart to observe the neglect into which the hawk had fallen. He would survey the scene of his former joys, and with such tears as spirits shed, mourn long over the melancholy stone which reigned over those hills and birds, 
that his own voice used to awaken into life and exaltation. His sorrow would receive new pregnancy when he perceived how scarce his brethren are in society, how obsolete their language and howlings are grown, and that a price is set on the head of the hawk, as if this generous bird had been guilty of the most atrocious crimes. The manifest inferiority of our age to his in sport would fill his soul with indignation. He would fly from the hated fight to his residence in the other world and carry tidings to the band of departed falconers which would communicate to them the angry emotions of his own breast. These reflections call up before me the majesty and honor of ancient times when every warlike baron prepared his hardy limbs for the toils of battle by the heavenly recreation and make me bewail my severe destiny which has thrown me forward into a generation which it is dangerous to paint in its true colors. Every turreted castle rears itself to my fancy, surrounded with hawks, perching on their blocks in stately order, or echoing from its vaults, responsive to the adjacent rocks and lakes, with the cheering voices of their keepers, who direct their circling flights. Now falcon and sports, loud, cold, and tremulous, Ushering in the morn strikes my mirror, which from the morn till the shades of evening deepens into night, animates the silent loneliness of the forests, vales, and mountains with tones of rain and gladness. Moonless game, yet undiminished by the gun's murderous violence, obscures the face of heaven with multitude, and offers to the wondering eyes of the spectators. All the varieties of sport to be derived from aerial chase and conflict. In this glorious period, indolence and disease were not collected at expense from every corner of the world, and luxury was a vice which did not vex the holy meekness of our priests, nor exacerbate the keen indignation of our satirists. The stimulating seductions of the table, prolonged not by the feast beyond nature's call, nor did the down and gorgeous furniture of the bed force voluptuous slumbers after the sun had proclaimed the day. The plain and copious meal by hunger seasoned and sleep profound as death by weariness brought on, flushed with ready health, the looks of nobles and gentles, gave a spring and fervent to their steps, and swelled their souls with courage and resolution, which laughed at me. They sought at this forest, and their country's wrongs demanded their souls. With humus and alacrity, and saluted to the field of battle, while they attended the fight to their hearts. These were the times when a man, inspired with the sublime enthusiasm of falconry, would wish to have lived. Those who are at present addicted to the pointer and gun are not, however, altogether inexcusable. Though those who first saw Sook the hawk can claim no sort of apology. The former are come into the world when fowling is the prevailing diversion, and so they along with the fashion, without once considering whether there be any diversion more worthy of their pursuit. To take a sure aim is celebrated as the grand accomplishment of the sportsman, and the number of thousand kills in a day is always rehearsed to his praise. According to the young gentleman who hears such discourses, that is the direction of his eye as soon as he is able to manage a gun and pants for this sort of bloody dexterity. He is extremely mortified when he returns unsuccessful from the field and received by his acquaintance with sarcasm and laughter. But when his hand and eye have done their duty, he produces the feathered spoils of the air with smiling triumph and is treated with respect by those around him. Thus his taste for sporting is so early corrupted that it can hardly ever be reformed afterwards, and he becomes the depraver of others in his turn. Might I obtain leave to name epicures and poachers in the same page with sportsmen, I would say the present plan of the recreations of the field seems calculated only for those people. The nice epicure depicts felicity from the bones of fat partridges, poults, and woodcocks, is deeply interested in the death of these fowls. And prompted by his licorice palate to kill as many of them as he can. 
The wandering poacher adopts the fame conduct from another motive, that of drawing bread and brandy from sauntering in idleness. The voluptuous epicure, therefore, and the work of poacher are furnished with reasons to justify the love of shooting on men, perfectly suitable to their respective characters, but by no means to that of a genuine sportsman, who professes to seek pleasure, not death, in his youth. There are two consequences of the gun, which I would humbly recommend to the notice of them. First, this engine sets the vulgar on a level with them in point of the sport of the field. And secondly, it threatens the utter destruction of the game. Here objects are at stake and ready to be annihilated. It is no less important than the rank of our gentry and the very existence of their pastimes. This is as true as it is alarming and calls for immediate remedy. First, with regard to the elevation of the vulgar to the rank of gentlemen, let the following observation meet with the attention they deserve. All men come into the world in nearly the same state of weakness and stupidity. Place an infant prince among the score of infant beggars, the former without ornaments and the latter without rags. Where is the man who could separate his highness from the lousy rogues at first sight? It is not the make of the body, therefore, nor the structure of the mind, which distinguishes the higher from the lower ranks of the Nature is equally beneficent to both gentlemen and peasants in these respects. And these are as capable as those of the polish of education and company. What then are the discriminating circumstances between them? Why, a line of ancestors remarkable for public and private virtues, opulent possessions originally conferred by the sovereign in approbation of high merit, and a conduct regulated by the laws of bravery, generosity, politeness, and justice. These are the foundations of true gentility, and always bestowed, whatever the man's birth is in whom they center. Gentility is displayed to the world sometimes by easy propriety, and sometimes by a dazzling magnificence of lodging, table, dress, opinion, and music. Beyond the reach of people on the lower stations of life, but to help by them with deference and respect. Now, could all men rise to the splendors of gentility, the real gentleman would see his dignity lost in the crowd, and himself without notice, unless his superior talents and virtues could command him. Whatever diversion, therefore, he pursues, in which the vulgar can share with him independently of his permission, diminishes from the submissive. Regards they owe to his character and situation in life. Accordingly, it is observable that a man of rank is treated with the freedom that approaches to familiarity in the field by the same persons who appear before him with the most bashful awkwardness in his drawing. This difference of behavior in different places is easily explained. The gentleman is seen in the field with his dog and a gun, an equipage in which they often see themselves and which, on that account, seems to shorten the distance between him and them. But the splendor of the drawing room and the elegance of his own dress raise him in their eyes to his natural elevation, and they have come timid and abashed into his presence. Thus the gun compels all ranks and conditions of men, and his father's diversion from any difference among them, from those of the inferior stations of life, who sport with it are more numerous than those in the highest. The numerous of the lives in the former that attempt the honor that might pretend to from the last. All, all the common people, are smitten with the loss of burning powder and scattering land. They roam over our hills and plains, treading in paths which anciently were to elves and heroes only known. They make the welkin ring an ignoble noise. Burst from rusty, firelocks vile. Every bowing shopkeeper and pale faced mechanic get short coats, old muskets, and reprobate setters, and steal away once or twice a week 
to masquerade from their lawful business, to make war on their beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air. The moor herds also look after their cattle in the same accoutrements, and the farmer, stimulated by the recital of their exploits, deserts his plough and strides over the heath in quest of adventures. Hence it happens that a well-bred man, when he fancies he decries a noble lord, and he wants to salute and his attendants at a distance, is surprised to fall in at last with the moving group of tailors, barbers, and shoemakers. Clumsy Cabestan can see the ridiculous sympathy of men of vivacity fire and blood. By a mistake of the same kind, when he imagines he sees one of his neighbors at the front of a remote hill whom he wishes to join, he is sadly disappointed in coming to discover a rather deep, thick bone mutton, thick with pine, with a musket jap hand over with foot lay across his stooping shoulders. Since, therefore, the diversions of gentlemen are descended to the vulgar, instead of marking gentility, they degrade it and expose it to some ridicule by some whimsical re-encounters as I just now mentioned. It is my way, when I want to know the nice thing of poverty in any case, to look into the conduct of the lady, and which I seldom know finding something that's directing to it, and I carefully embrace this opportunity mentioning to the glory of the sex that there is decency and delicacy and dignity of sentiment and behavior in question they never fail to be thought with the most beautiful procedure on the right side the rapid succession of their fashions in dress demonstrates how tenacious the ladies are of the characteristics of their rank which are in hourly danger of being vulgarified by the too quick imitation of a servile and mean females. Whenever this happens, they study a new dress, and whereby cut off all comparison between themselves and shaved women. In similarly, now proud of inventions which their superiors have abandoned. This behavior of the ladies is truly noble and spirited, and the application of it to the present case is so obvious that I need not enlarge on it as they leave off the use of any fashion which the vanity of the lower part of the sex gentlemen will see that they ought to abstain from a diversion which has acquired an air of meanness from having fallen among the dregs of people falconry is ready to afford them an entertainment infinitely above their peculiar and drunken distress an entertainment becoming a vanity inaccessible to the populace they productive of the highest luxury of the Nor can gentlemen insinuate themselves so agreeably any other way as by talking on the good graces of the ladies who are all fond of this ancient, noble, and delightful recreation. It is my felicity to be known to several women whose distinguished virtues are honorable to their sex and ornamental to their rank who favor the hawks with their presence and regard their flight with a sprightly effect. Who favor the hawks with their presence and regard their flights with the sprightliest admiration. From them the floats of sky receive a delicate polish and most joyous by that. The hardy, nimble, sonorous falconer feels his sport most exhilarating and delightful when refined gallantry props his endeavors to please female youth, beauty, and innocence. The animated spring of his limbs and the lively current of his blood, despite the chilling sun, the steep mountain, the crunching rock, the trembling bark, the prickly thicket, and his heart beats eager to show the charms to members of his eyes. Thus the ladies, wherever they appear, inspire an ambition for excellence. And the recruiting smile, this will be with every effort the men can make to entertain. The second consequence of the gun, which I mentioned is the destruction of the game. Not indeed by gentlemen who have an able title to the sports of the field, but by those who confer on themselves the honor of that appellation, and by their inferior poachers. 
The illicit ufe of the gun is at prefent rifen to fuch a daring pitch, that unlefs the laws, wildly provided againft it, be put in execution without mercy, there fhall not, in a few years, be found a poult of archery for the whole kingdom to draw a trigger of fly hawk at. But neither this, nor the confusion of rank, are the only bad consequences, though, to be sure, very deplorable, which are to be apprehended from the prevailing passion of all men for the gun. I look forward to the fear and anger to another consequence before which these must lose all of their force, I mean, the ruin of our happy constitution in both church and state, which heaven avert. Shooting on wing trains up an incredible number of stout fellows to the knowledge of firearms, and to the love of idleness and low debauchery. From these arises, in peaceable times, a constant succession of smugglers and robbers, to supply the places of those delinquents who are prematurely cut off by the immoderate use of brandy or the gallows. Now, should it be the affliction of a distant posterity to be visited with the civil war, these roads would not find it very difficult to advance to the top of the vocations and commence upon plungers of professed cutthroats. These are not to be compared to the fair and honest soldier, who meets you on equal terms, who, while he seeks your life for the sake of public safety and justice, bravely ventures his own to your indignation. They, on the contrary, will attack your property in defense with our suits, or shoot you from behind the bush while you are enjoying the sweet serenity of a summer's morning in the nightgown of slippers. End part one of introduction. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.